Hello, welcome to another Netflix commentary track. Today we are watching The Never Ending Story from 1984, directed by Wolfgang Peterson, starring some people. And joining me today is Michael. Go ahead and say a quick hello there, Michael. Hello, everyone. Glad you could join us. And we are watching a classic tonight. I have so many good memories watching this movie. And I'm going to give you all fair warning right now. Getting through this without crying is going to be near impossible, but I'll do my best. So if you'd like to actually, well, hold on. Let me give out a little bit of a shout out to not sponsors, but friends of the show. When I eat any meal at home or even away, I eat with Nork. That's K-N-O-R-K dot net. That's where you go to get the Nork. It is a knife fork combination. It's awesome. Not cold press, but forged titanium flatware. It will impress your girlfriend's dad. And you can use my promo code FRY45 at checkout at Nork.net for 45% off. It doesn't get better than that. If you'd like to watch The Never Ending Story on Netflix with us, go ahead, queue up to 0000, zero, zero, zero and hit play now. Pretty sweet deal if I do say so myself. Now, I've got the, the new Warner Brothers Pictures logo up there. If you're watching this on DVD, you may not. I do have this on DVD. It was a very bare bones uh, cardboard front DVD, you know, that type. Warner yeah. Brothers used to put out in the early 2000s. Does it still say a Time Warner company or any of that stuff? I think it I think it did. Yeah, underneath. And here we are fading I, to the movie. I really dig the song here, the Lamal uh, tune here. Unfortunately, I think most people the the youngins, the Zoomers, their familiarity with this comes from watching Stranger Things last summer. Uh, when a pivotal point in the movie just had to go throw in some nostalgia. Hey, I'm only going to give you the, the password if you sing the never-ending story. Mm -hmm. The effect here is done with uh, an aquarium. You fill up aquarium with uh, dye, and you slush it around, and you get clouds. Beyond that, I don't have a ton of tidbits. This was my favorite movie when I was a child until Terminator 2 existed. I watched this ad nauseum, tried to get my dad to record it on the Disney Channel when we'd have free Disney Channel preview weekend type sort of thing. And they had some kind of scrambler in there that prevented you from actually recording. Uh so that's that's a weird thing. I maybe you know uh, you have some more of the tidbits ready to go about yeah. who made the puppets and yeah, things we'll like that. that. But still, I, now I, if I, you're watching this in America, there is something that needs to be said here. The American version of this has a different score than the European score. European score is all orchestral. This one has uh, a lot of Giorgio Moroder in it. And most people will tell you the European one is superior. I strongly disagree. I think all those effects still look pretty good to this day. Uh, I could see this being a movie people could say aged poorly in the effects. Uh, when we get there, you'll see how stiff the faces of some of the puppeteered creatures are and, and the limitations of Falcor. Yeah. Visually, I like the way everything looks, regardless. I think they did a great job painting Fantasia. This is Wolfgang Peterson's first American film. Uh, after Dust Boot, he was, he was uh, got a lot of notoriety. Yeah, and Comes to America, makes this. Later after this, what did he do? In the Line of Fire, Air Force One. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, didn't he do, what was that movie? Um about the there's not a lot of movies like this though from him like this is a very odd jump from Das Boot to the never ending story like a kid's film and kid's perfect stuff storm. was now I remember. money the perfect storm yeah but what do you do anything in the 80s or 90s okay the 90s air force one right but in the line of fire what in the 80s really nothing after this i don't I, think i'd look into that and here's gerald mcrenny playing the dad and he did did he just put a raw egg oh in that shake oh my god that, is that is that Gerald McRaney? Yeah. I didn't realize that. That's you know, Major Dad? That's him. And he's one of those actors who, if you look up his bio, there's always a different, a conflicting birthday on him. Some sources say August 19, 1947. Others say August 19, 1948. 
I've seen, the last I saw him, he played Jimmy Smith's dad in a revival of the 24 series, and he's barely older than Jimmy Smith's. So it was unintentionally funny. Barrett Oliver, I think the following year, he is in Cocoon, right? Yeah. No. Uh, the- he, he got kicked around in a few uh, 80s movies here and there, but I don't recall seeing much of him in the 90s. Me neither. Now I'll let fans decide. Do you think the dad's being too harsh on him during this scene? Uh, yeah. He's he's very much, we gotta get over it. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, she was her mom. She died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very dismissive. But I do need to watch the sequel, which is on Netflix. I haven't seen the sequel since it came out. Didn't much care about it. Um... Uh, so it's been a very it's been nearly 30 years since I've seen the sequel. I think Netflix has the wrong date on it. It's available on Netflix and it says 1989. And I I'm pretty sure it was like 91 was when the Never Ending Story 2 came out. Got to keep your feet on the ground, champ. Mhm. I'm sorry, but Bastion's what? 10 or 11? I'm sorry, but losing your mother at that age is not something you get over very easily. He looks so young, too. I mean, I looked like a teenager when I was his age, so I think you could understand me getting that talk. But um, and him, not so much. Because when I was, like, eight years old, I went to Six Flags Over Texas, and they had, like, oh, well, guess your age, your weight, whatever. All right, good luck guessing my age. 16? No, I'm eight. How far away does he live from this school anyway? He has to walk through this kind of it metropolitan area. It always puzzles area. me and when ha- I see kids walking alone anywhere in a in a movie because it's just like a kid walking alone in the city is getting kidnapped in, in my way of thinking, you know. But in the in '80s movies, it happens. Is this maybe like Toronto? I think. I think so. I don't think it's an American city. Pretty sure it's Canada. And did he, did he get bullied by these guys before? Not the garbage can. Oh, uh, yeah, he must be accustomed to this. Ugh, nice. I mean, like, they have a system worked out. You get the lid. What was in there? Someone threw their grass off their stoop? Like, like I, I don't know. Looked like hay to me. Looked like, looked like hay. Yeah, what are you doing with hay on your ledge? Not again. Okay, all these people getting in the way would have distracted them, but wouldn't they have seen him run inside the store? Come on. I don't think anyone returns for the sequel. Maybe Coriander? <clears throat> maybe the actor that plays him? I'm not sure. Uh, who plays him? There, There is a guy who does some voices in this movie who I'm trying to predict dies soon. His name's Alan Oppenheimer. He's the narrator. He's also the voice of Falcor. Yeah, and he's... And he's the voice of Skeletor. And he's the voice of Gmork. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that too. But I've I just been thinking of He-Man a lot lately. There was a cross... He was in an episode of Star Trek Voyager, which I've been binge-watching. I'm like, he's dying soon. It's a sign. The beep, 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 beeps of the arcade. Yep. Yeah. Well, you won't find arcade around there anyhow these days. Here's Thomas Hill playing Mr. Coriander. He was the voice of Uncle Owen in the radio drama version of Star Wars. Oh. Give him a good what punch in the nose, is that what he says? Yeah. Preaching violence to the youth in the 80s for, and that could get a little laugh out of the audience too. Back in the day, that was like your your humor attempt. This movie is a little short on humor, uh, but heavy on the drama and uh, the scary elements. Rated PG, intended for kids. It certainly has a lot of. Adventure and, and thrilling excitement, though. Yeah, I'm so right it's into not that. boring. But I'll tell you what what really bothers me is when I bring this movie up to people, they're like, "Oh, isn't that isn't it like really long?" 
I'm like, okay, it's called the never ending story. It doesn't mean it's over long. Perhaps this would have been a bigger hit if they called it Fantasia, though of course that one would think that name's taken by Disney. Um, I mean, they could maybe call it something else, but the never ending story makes it seem uh, like like it's going to get boring with the, a title like that. Yeah, but with what Corey Anders explaining to him, you know, this book isn't like anything you've ever read before. That's the, kind of the meaning behind it. Because when he's up in the attic reading all holding. of this, he's just immersed mm-hmm. into it. He's he's um, he's actually experiencing it. There might be uh, in different versions of this film uh, the the German language. You <laughs> see the book "Interlich Geschichte" instead of the never ending story. The book is different. I don't think it's something they did in post. I think they shot a different scene or inserted a, a shot of a different book in places. So did he, did Coriander want Bastion to take the book? He was kind of like inviting him I to really it. I really feel then, like it. And then later, right here where he takes the book and leaves the note, you know, don't worry, I'll return your book. He smiles like, oh, g- good. I was hoping he would take it. No, I, see, I thought he knew he took it right here. He turns and he's like, aha, he took it. He smiles. Then he looks down like, huh? He took it? What? So it seems conflicting to me. Like, uh, it's missing? Why, why was he smiling when the kid left if he didn't think he took the book? Like, it, uh, it's something to nitpick, I guess. He was testing him just to see if he would really be courageous enough to take it. Oh, speaking of tests... Oh no, it's math test. I'm not coming in. I don't think that we needed to look down and see the note. Uh, that oh, Well, I guess it, so that it doesn't look like he up and stole it, that he's borrowing it. We need the note. But his the reaction on Coriander's face just doesn't seem to match. It, it's like he, he took the book. I'm happy. Oh, oh crap. He took the book. Uh, math test in what grade? Hmm. Uh, if he's 10, is he in fourth grade? Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah, all the kids know how to get to the attic, you know, just... Uh... That's okay. Who li- Wouldn't the janitor have a key to the attic? Like, I don't know, somewhere where no one else could take it? Or like a key assigned to him? The the key is just oh, right yeah, there the in that little has a piece of broken of glass keys. where someone could just take it. Which leads me to wonder how many times has he been up in this attic before? And if that's broken glass, that's got to be a fire alarm to pull, right? You think? Not a key holding spot. And all throughout, you know, is he not at all... these floor mats where the kids are hooking up. I was all throughout, and is he not at all worried on? someone would come in the attic and find him? Guess not. You know, there were movies back in the 80s and, and some in some of the early 90s where they played like a framing device. The kid reads the book and then the character is acted out or the kid tells the story. And so Bastion is the framing device for the adventure we're going to get here in Fantasia. I don't see that happen these days, do you? No. There's... Uh, What's his name? Deep? Deep. Uh, yeah, Deep Roy, Roy, Roy playing Roy Deep, Top Hat. Deep Roy, and that's it, yeah. A little trivia, he was also one of the musicians in Jabba's Palace and Return of the Jedi. I didn't know that. I think uh, people are familiar, more familiar with uh, Deep Roy from the uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate... Charlie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right, with Johnny Depp. Yeah, and Tilo But Prattner. he is dubbed over here, whereas I think everybody else is not, so... This is not his speaking voice that we'll be hearing. Yeah, Tilo Prockner. I think this Rockbiter thing looks great. He passed away earlier this year. Oh. The Racing Snail, I'm totally fine with. The Rockbiter looks cool. Of course, you're you're going to have some issues getting the Rockbiter off of his uh, trike or steamroller, you know? Mm hmm. See, so you, you have to kind of creatively edit around that. 
I like the I like the uh, narcolepsy bat. All, all the, these are nice characters. Like you get something out of them and early, you know. I mean, very little screen time. They get to be quite endearing. I can't remember seeing this in theater so much, but definitely on VHS or HBO so this many times. Is, and this looks so vibrant, too. They cleaned it up for the DVD. It looks really vibrant on Netflix as well. It's oh, got definitely. a great pop to it. When I'd see this on TV back in the day, it looks so much more washed out. Imagine you're made of rocks, so you eat rocks. Mm. I'm trying to think who all even here comes back for the sequel. I think they're of these characters. I think the rock biter returns. I think there's a third movie also, which I don't think I've seen, but uh, the second movie, I think they give rock biter a kid. Yeah. I haven't seen the sequel. Is it any good by the way? It's not good. They change things around so that there is a distinct antagonist. There's like an evil queen. And I think they have to undo some things. Like uh, somebody dies and you, you undo it by reading different or something like that. Uh, it, Bastion gets pulled into Fantasia. So he's there alongside. You know what? I think Atreyu's <clears throat> in it. I think maybe they changed the actor on Atreyu, but uh, but yeah, Bastion and Atreyu are actually share screen time. I think they also changed the princess, uh, uh, the empress. Sorry, um, yeah. Jonathan Brandis is Bastion in part two. He really seemed to have like... a lot going on in the nineties. He was even, sort of a, a teen heartthrob sort. I was going to say, it sounds like they don't even bring back the same actors. No, see, I was trying to think if they had anybody returning, and I, they may it may not be. This was not a big hit at the box office. I was under the impression it was, because I thought, well, this, this is so good, everybody's got to like this. It surely made a lot of money. Uh, I think modest hit... It probably made its money back, but it's no E.T. when it comes to revenue. Well, you have to think of it this way. This was 1984. Look at all the competition it was up against. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, The Karate Kid, Footloose. 1984 is very interesting because um, after, after Return of the Jedi, everything, the floodgate opened for everybody to have the next big hit franchise. Yeah. So it's like everybody was saving up, and then they just unleashed. Let's see what else. Splash. Terminator, Gremlins, Splash. And Grim the list oh, goes yeah, on. Gremlins. Beverly Hills Cop, the biggest movie of 84. Ghostbusters. It, that is one loaded year. And we're going to see the racing snail in action. I like all the music throughout this movie. This doo 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 doo. -doo. It's great, but the Ivory Tower score just really gets me. It kind of it, it just always makes me tear up. Same here. And the, and the assholes in Europe don't even know the song because they've been hearing a different Ivory Tower theme. Uh-oh, the nothing. I 
So everyone's gathering to go to the ivory tower because the nothing has taken away their place. But, but they're kind of confused when it's like, what do you mean a hole? Oh yeah, we had the same problem, you know, but it's like, we, you, maybe you should be aware of it. You're all talking about the same thing. Mucho tree destruction. Beautiful shots in the sky. Ooh, look at that. Beautiful tracking yeah, shot I could, right I there. Watch, I could watch IMAX outtakes of that. This kind of reminds me, too, of The Lost Boys a few years later after this scenes when... The Lost Boys had a lot of... Instead of showing them flying, they would just put the camera in the air, kind of cheat around it. Yeah, which the may camera have been would be the their better, eyes you know? when they're flying around, but... In, at one point, I think in the middle of the movie, there there's an upper tracking shot up in the clouds, which is supposed to be the vampire gang returning to their lair. There was there was a shot like that tracked out of their lair and up, or or did it go with the reverse? It was awesome, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. The, these matte paintings look great, and the, uh, the miniature work, all this stuff really hits well. Also, look at how how good. Um, I think that's got to be a composite with, with that. But they did a great job uh, getting the uh, it sharp. You know, not having like a big black outline. Look, it was maybe high. that. That I think that's composite. I don't think that's reprojection. It, I mean, it could be either. Now, I wonder if this has ever gone up for auction, like chunks of the ivory tower. Put that on your on your desk at your mm. office, right? That'd be worth a pretty penny. It is my understanding that the Oron is in Steven Spielberg's desk, or his office, which I don't know why he would have it. I don't think his name is on this movie anywhere. I was very confused about the uh, the childlike empress. So, uh, would you, if she's the empress, do you need to call her childlike? Uh, I mean, I guess it's a little confusing, isn't it? You'd think, but it's to establish to the audience. It, it, it she's sounds a derogatory. Young empress, so they're just referring to her as such until we finally see her. But they could have just called her simply the Empress, and that was it. And then finally, when we see her towards the yeah. end of the film, and she's like twelve years old, oh yeah, she, it, it could she's be a, a child surprise empress. that she's young. Uh, that would have been better. But instead, now they, that you bring they that kind up. of blow the surprise here. Uh, this guy's the speaker for the the Empress. Uh, we have all these eclectic characters. A lot of them have like dual heads or multiple faces on one head. And it's kind of like, hey, guess which which one's the real face on some of these you'll see here. Night Hub is kind of like, I don't have an official invitation, so I'm going to hang out over here. An illness and the nothing. There seems to be a connection. Similar movie, Legend, with Tom Cruise. I think that was it came out in 1985 in Europe, but here, I think a year later or so. Legend really plays like the Legend of Zelda w w got a lot of inspiration from that movie. But, uh, all, but similar fantasy-type elements about it. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking, uh, he hunts the uh, purple buffalo, right? We never see the buffalo, do we? No, it's or it's maybe it's alluded to or a reference in the film. Well, wait, we see at the end of the movie he's riding with Artex, but is there purple buffalo? Mm, we'll find out. I don't, not that I recall. But if we're talking video games based on little kind of like fantasy elements, back in the day, the one that sticks in my head most is Rygar. It was one of those games which, where it's which. 
which movies like that? Uh, it's not really based on a movie. It was a game released by Tecmo. If you like Google it, I'm, maybe you'll I'm see it played before or remember it. With it. But it's one of yeah, those games it where it's like, like you a go barbarian so far, type guy. Yeah, you go so far and you're trying to figure out what am I supposed to pick up? What am I supposed to do? Back when the manuals didn't tell you as much as you really wanted to know. But now, I remember when I finally beat the boss, about... I was like, how did everyone in my class was asking me, how did you get so far? How'd you get the wind pulley? Well, my answer, best answer, it's easier than you think. But back to the film I... here. Here is Noah Hathaway as a Treyu. If you look if you look him up or what he looks like now, if you were just to bump into him off the street, you'd be, Oh my god. You're Noah Hathaway. You were a, you're a Treyu. He looks so different now. He he has a lot of tattoos. I think his face. I can see some of the similarities there. Some of these child actors, it's like they have features that make them a cute kid, but they're not going to grow into a handsome adult. Macaulay Culkin, for example. If you see him, watch his old films now. You can kind of understand. Yeah, I understand how he doesn't turn into a leading man. Elijah Wood, even. Like, there's not a lot of them that really have the features that they can grow out of the cute features to get the leading man features. I think that in in some spoiler-type way here, Atreyu is a child because the book knows that a kid is reading it and therefore has to hit him with the re relatability, right? Right, and they're playing it two ways. It's... Bastion's reading all of this wondering, huh, could they be referring to me? But Atreo's called forth. They're doubting him. Oh, you're just a kid? <laughs> Where's the real warrior? And he's like, all right, I'll just go back to my business if you don't want my help. But it's to establish Atreo. Yeah, not Atreo the child, Atreo the warrior. That's the two established Atreyu. I would Atreyu's watch this. I didn't. With. I I did not feel as though Atreyu was the same age as Bastion. He looked. I can kind of see them looking about the same age. Now that I'm an adult looking at it, but Atreyu looked uh, several years older than Bastion. In in my eyes, as a kid. Yeah. Well, in real life, we're talking a two year age difference between them. No Which can be substantial by two years. Yeah, two grades. You can you can recognize who's in what grade when you're walking around in grade school. It, there's nothing. I, it it was kind of like being a Highlander, you know. Like you can you can spot one. Like I I can sense a an Immortals here, right? Like you knew who was younger and who was older. Yeah. In school. And to anyone wondering, so there's the Auron that supposedly yeah. Spielberg has. To anyone wondering, no, Noah Hathaway is not Anne Hathaway's brother. Oh, he isn't. Hmm. Is there a relation, cousin, any of that stuff? Uh, are you familiar with Ben Shapiro? Uh, vaguely. His cousin is Matilda, and the, the youngest daughter in, in uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, and, and the girl in uh, Miracle on, what, 40-something Street, you know, with the Santa Claus from Jurassic Park? Uh kind of messed up that title but hey there's some horsies in the back and look like purple buffalo but we got to get you tracking some shots uh, of this landscape there's matte painting looking pretty good there we're going to get introduced to gamork the champion of the nothing that's one thing i love about these fantasy movies we've got a beautiful landscape and you bring along the right people to do a map painting, possibilities are endless. You know, they put so much stuff in the backgrounds in movies these days, but you never really feel like you went to that world or, or, or are familiar with it. I get a pretty good sense of what Fantasia's like with much a much different pace you know giving us some time to take in the details
I also didn't realize Bastion's name was Bastion until many years later. I thought it was Sebastian. I thought that's what they were saying. Same here. Because who's ever heard of a Bastion? Uh, I mean, Sebastian's already fairly uh, rare for a nickname or for a name these days, but I've never heard of a Bastion. It's a great idea. I'm going to have me an apple. I have never had a sandwich come out of a Ziploc bag that was worth a damn. They Once it goes in the Ziploc bag, it comes out just tasting awful. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it was. Same here. I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. What's he got there? Peanut butter and jelly? Probably. It, like, emulsifies together. It, it becomes... It goes bad, I tell you. Mm-hmm. It's it's just like leftovers. Some things just don't taste as good the next day. Some... There are some things that heat up mighty well, and uh, some things certainly do not. Like, you can't heat up a hamburger well. You can eat a pizza pretty decent. Well, there's a little trick Man, I Man, they discovered. really had to put him around the world on that horse, didn't mm-hmm. they? To search, search for... Uh, he doesn't even know what he's searching for, right? He's just going places. Mm-hmm. I was going to not to go off that topic. That was a cool effect with that crystal there. There's a little trick I discover with leftovers. Don't use the microwave. I have found that some uh, fried chicken will work well in the microwave. Uh, you have to be very careful, though. You want to go half power. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets rubber. And we're establishing okay. Gamork's hot on his trail. But oh, he yeah. turns up oh, at kids, the things right are location. about to get sad. The swamp mm. of sadness, right? Yeah, we know it's coming. Aptly named. Man, we have not spent much time with Artex, but we you certainly feel it when he goes down. Now there is a lot in the way of uh urban legend surrounding uh, the scene coming here. Did the horse actually fall and and get stuck and drowned because the elevator got jammed uh, and then actually die, there doesn't seem to be a lot of confirmation or denial on that. Are you familiar with this rumor? Uh, vaguely. Haven't really seen those movies. Uh, good effect here if the fog It's making this entire swamp area look all the more eerie. I guess it could be dried ice. It's, it certainly looks like a vast swamp. They probably walked back and forth in the same area, shot it coming and going to make it look bigger. Where was this filmed even? This was probably a soundstage someplace. I, I don't think this is outdoors. No, I'm going to stand here. I'm I'm probably bolted to the floor. I got to stand here. How does a horse get sad? From just walking. You know, I guess this the sadness permeates throughout the swamp, huh? And it got to him. That's why it I is took kind it of bad as. when he's like, "Come on, you stupid horse!" Like when he gets when he gets going like that, it's like, "Oh, you had to call him stupid." That makes him more sad. He, you know, if you made this with kind of a Care Bears mentality, he would have cheered him up to get him out of this, right? Do you think that could have got him out of this out of the swamp? It could have, but you're beautiful. You're strong. You can do anything. You gotta do something then, to tug on the audience's heartstrings. And the scene. You know what's home. amazing is. The, the horse cheats death, ultimately. He he comes back by the end of the movie. I don't feel like most people realize that. Like, this is the the one time a character death reversal, see, this the death really sticks with the audience. You know what I mean? Yeah, and people who own horse ranches or, you know, even had a horse they, since they take care of, or just own a pet in general, they can relate to this so much. It's like... When you have a pet you've had for and loved for so many years, then it passes away. One, he or she passes away one day. That 
I think the a horse we all dying speak from really experience on that. The, the girls. The girls always want a pony, right? And then Bastion's really crying when we cut to him. Oh, boy. About looks like he's got milk coming down his eyes. It's, it's so white. And I keep thinking, if you're an actor, you have to cry in a movie. What do you do? Think of something that makes you cry. I have seen uh, people Atreyu costume, and they, they'll do it with Falcor, but no one ever does the Atreyu fa uh, costume with a, a bucket of mud that they're carrying around with a, a harness like leash attached. That would be one way to go about it, right? Okay. You know what? I might do that for Halloween, see if anyone understands it. Worth a try. Music here, also good. This is back in the 80s, guys, when they gave a shit about the music in their movies. I do uh, actually set out to watch many films simply because Giorgio Moroder did the score for them. Uh, and that can be a, a fairly delightful experience. Uh, I, I came across... Um, uh, American Gigolo and uh, oh gosh, what's the Turkish prison movie? Oh, mm, not sure about that no, one. I know he contributed to Top Gun score. Yes, and I think he did the uh, rescored version of Metropolis, like you know the re-release version. He did 1984. Uh, it's produced by G Giorgio Moroder. They found more footage after the fact, but you at one point you could find that one on Netflix. You could find both versions on Netflix at one point. Uh, I do have some of the songs from that on I uh, downloaded from iTunes, and it was a big hit in my film classes. People people liked that version of Metropolis because it it took all of the text cards out of the film and just replaced it with subtitles so it was like watching a foreign film yeah instead of the pacing of a silent film okay now atreyu has got a little mud under his eye why does no one call cut and ask him to wipe it off Well, you may be a bit ahead of me. He isn't. He's climbing up the tree now. That's what I'm seeing now. Okay. This is a very cool effect too. You get so much, uh, such, such a giant sense out of the size of the turtle. You think this turtle is female? Morla? Kind of has an elder, elderly lady type voice about it. It sounds female, but... There was a Star Trek original series character named Morla who was a guy, so... Eh, come to your own conclusion. I think there was an American miniseries on like Family Channel or something, early 2000s of the Never Ending Story, like a redo of it. I hadn't seen it, but I, I knew of its existence because I think I saw it on, available on DVD at Walmart. Are you, are you aware of that? Vaguely. I think I know what you're Doesn't talking about. Doesn't the Never Ending Story times. seem like the type of thing somebody like Netflix, Amazon, whoever would be like, hey, here's something people have heard of. We can redo it and do a reboot series. Doesn't it seem like somebody should be fighting over that? Yeah. They That's did it with the Dark Crystal, like, which just got canceled. Hollywood, don't do it. Just If the original movie is good as it is, don't bother. But right, nostalgia it's, it's is not primarily all the they... The thing is, it's about making money in some yeah. way. And it's like they, they just have to get their fingers on whatever people have heard of. Because mm -hmm. if you make something new, people aren't going to talk like talk about it ahead of time. You talk about a reboot, people will will cry or or bemoan it or whatever. But at least they're talking about, it. and that's the way they see it. Is like any PR is good PR. Whatever makes the money, 
Big time sneezes coming out of this. Just nostalgia. That's what we've been getting so much of lately with Hollywood anymore. <clears throat> Not that it matters, but yes. Kind of Yoda-like dialogue here. Like a... Um, I, I, instead of being straightforward with what you're going to say, just keep saying it doesn't matter. It seems to be a lot of creatures trying to be like Yoda in that regard in the 80s. Like the, the fantasy character goes to the creature, right? And then they, they're sort of like reluctantly helping, you know? Yeah. Or just a mentor character in general. I mean, realistically, Yoda didn't seem to be all aboard helping Luke Skywalker. He was kind of... Uh, he was. You could either make the case that he was testing him or, or gaining interest later. It's hard to gauge. The Southern Oracle. Ah, uh, yes. It's a long ways away. If only I did my trekking in, a, in like another direction, right? Right, but intuitively, what's your only what's your only alternative? Start moving, get walking. Maybe something will happen along the way to make rings. everything go faster. This being a book, fairly mobile entertainment. He could have taken this home with him, right? Mm-hmm. But his dad is such a dick. I uh, may as well stay in this attic. Hey, the school's empty. I can go to any classroom I want now. Nope, I'm going to go back to the attic, right? Uh-huh. And the dad doesn't call the school or come to the school or find out what where he is? I, I do recall in the sequel, the dad has much more interest in where is Bastion. So the movie will cut away to, like, the dad. I think the dad's hanging out with the bookkeeper and... They're trying to figure out where where the kid the kid's gone missing or something like that. Lights out. I was gonna say the thing about you know it got where, instantly. It's so many. It's so stormy. many miles away where you have to go, and a tree is crying. But that's so far. You know, real life scenarios you could think of so many situations like that. So many difficult situations you're trying to resolve or get out of things may not it's just life's lessons things aren't always as hopeless as they seem okay so he ran down he was going to leave the attic or go down some staircase uh and then he's like no i'm not oh but but the lightning it's just so scary But how everything changes in the attic so much, it's it's like he's being more and more immersed into the story he's reading. He's experiencing it. Well, see how it. quickly that went into a lightning storm? Like, like we just saw the kids leaving at loose daylight. They were exiting school. Cut to lightning, scaring yeah. Bastion. Did some time pass since he was... Did he since he went outside the attic to see everyone then? leave, and then when he went back upstairs to the attic, did was there some time uh, lapse? Maybe he missed we out missed on there? his bathroom break. Maybe that's what was happening. Because uh, he didn't get back to reading, that's for sure. And right here, where the camera is Gamork's eyes as he's running, this reminds me of an American Rolf in London when we're going through the dream yes. sequences or the scenes where the werewolf is chasing its victims there's Th that there's a very trick in horror movies where the camera is the killer's here. eyes when when falcor grasps a tray you it's it's not the best effect um it's limitations in in action here you'll see we just have to get really close up because that's how else are we going to do this right uh-huh Barely misses. I can see them doing that way differently with today's visual technology. That was a close call either way. Gamork is massive, isn't he? Like, that's got to be like a, I don't know, 900-pound wolf. 
It's like a tiger-like wolf, isn't it? Yeah. Or an evil mutation of a wolf, at least. Oh, I all do off. enjoy the Falcor design. I think it looks really cool. I have never thought of a dragon being furry before, but now I mean, you don't even see any other instances of furry dragons. It's kind of Chinese New Year dragon-like in shape, mm-hmm. but I, I like the uh, the pearlescent like beads for skin and the fur, the face. It all looks good, but there's so many limitations. Like if he's going to be talking at all, he's going to be like not moving like oh hey my my mouth will move slowly i have to talk slowly because at the time and i think this is still the case this is the biggest puppet ever made for a movie it's like 40 feet long yeah look at his body it's not a bunch of servos and things it's ropes that puppeteers are pulling on and you can actually ride falcor at a there's a german museum i think it's in berlin or it might be Frankfurt. I think it's Berlin. They have Falcor there from the first movie. They've had to retouch him up. A lot of things have fallen off and things. So they've they've tried to upkeep him, but you can you can ride on Falcor and get a picture. This is a really great design. There's nothing else that looks looked like this for a dragon before this movie. I think. Yeah, look at him. He's like half canine, half reptilian. I mean, Not he's the got best basically the body teeth. of a dragon. The the teeth you can see look like white paint and not uh, shiny. And look, Atreus all cleaned off now. Yeah, how did that happen? Oh, wait, he said... Didn't he say that these two uh, in the tunnel there were taking care of him? And then he, then they must have just put him back on falcor to sleep i don't know like look realistically falcor saying he can't reach his ears right wouldn't wouldn't that motion be done differently today there'd be much more kicking about falcor would be standing up showing how tall he is it, it, there would be there'd be a lot more movement in this scene today uh-huh but we want to be playful have a trio come along and scratch his ear let's be affectionate I love this landscape here. Look around, you see some stars in the sky from where they are. Yeah, and they're twinkling. Which I don't think stars twinkle like that. That would be more like a bunch of satellites. How far away is he? He says like you're one mile away or something. Not 10,000 miles. No, I got you. Okay, so you're 111 miles away. You can see Falcor's tail behind Atreyu there. Notice how it's kind of like swerving up and down. Kind of like a Yeah, I a mean that's not something to too hard for them to move. Uh but they certainly can't get it make him get up from his from laying down. Mm-hmm. That that's out of the cards. And we'll see some familiar faces playing Ingwuk and Urgle here in a few minutes. Yes. Um, Plain Urkel is Patricia them. Hayes. She was also Finn Rizel and Willow. And Plain Inglewook okay. is Sidney Bromley. He was one of the... He's in Dragon Slayer, right? Yeah. And going back to an American werewolf in London, he was one of the homeless guys who gets killed by the werewolf. Oh, didn't realize that. Though, you know what? I think I've seen him elsewhere and been like, hey, it's uh, he's from the Marine story. But uh, I can't recall what else I was thinking. Uh I like the effect here of how they made uh, Atreyu look so much larger than them. They did a good job with that. I, I think a lot of it's the force perspective. Mm-hmm. I keep mentioning Willow. Have you? Did you ever get around to seeing that? I have not seen it. I don't believe it's streaming on a platform I can watch. It is something I've put on my to-watch list. 
Oh, he's well. <laughs> now it's my turn. So she had been kind of nursing him up. Evidently washed his clothes and put them back on him. They didn't have a bed for him to stay in, so... Well, I, I mean, he can't even fit in their hole, so just leave him out there to sleep on the luck dragon. Mm-hmm. The tree does look bigger than them. He's massive, yeah. See that little cup? There we go. Batwing broth, eye of newt, yep. Rancid sea serpent... The fantasy movies, there's always going to be a concoction of odd stuff. It's not going to be, here's simple apple juice to drink, right? Or some sort of medication that you drink down. Potions, yeah. You know, like, it's weird there's no potion that does something to him. Potions are very much a fantasy staple. He doesn't have a sword. He doesn't. He had a bow and arrow, right? And he left that behind. He had to go with no weapons for, for reasons, right? Yeah. And again, we didn't see him hunting a purple buffalo. It's mentioned, but we didn't see it earlier. Uh, that, that could I have recall. been sad violence, you know, for the kids. Yeah, let's leave it out. This is, does, uh, this is adapted from a novel, German novel. I don't know if there was a sequel or what to it, but, you know, they try to get more movies out of this. See how much bigger Atreyu is? He studies the Southern Oracle, but he, he's not going to go very close. I guess uh, Falcor is napping. Why does he need to take the wheelbarrow? He can just climb up there like Atreo just did. They make climbing walls look so easy in movies. They do. They make so now many things look, look easy at, in movies, come that. to think of it. I guess, you know, if there is uh, some composite trigger to this, you have that black background from the night sky making it a little easier, but... It's weird that you have you have the two gates to to go through for the Southern Oracle, okay? But this first gate is the exactly like the Southern Oracle, just one's like sand and one's like ice. It's or it's it's almost like the same model shot with different lights around it. Yeah. But the first one's a test to once again Testing your emotions. Can you make it through this first gate? Ah, hey, we just so happen to have a a tough stranger knight come by. See how he does. Uh huh. How convenient. Just so happens. And of these two statues, um, look closely at them as to what kind of sticks out. Most visibly. Yeah, this is one of the things that gets brought up when you mention the Neverend Story. Oh, yeah, the statues with the boobs. Uh, it's odd that they were able to get that in. You know, like, the, I, I realize these are statues. They're not moving around all that. There's, there's still no way they would have this design today. Let's see. This movie's PG rated. Oh, many of things were PG with far far more going on yeah the Beastmaster is one hard pg in 1982 and i remind you indiana jones and the temple of doom the same year as this if i'm not mistaken that's the movie that started the pg-13 rating thing i th well that's in at, on spielberg's suggestion mm -hmm. realistically i think the Beastmaster is far more gruesome and sexualized than temple of doom and therefore should have been the point where things changed but it was it was a modest hit and it was sort of a b movie that 
people thought was uh, aping uh, Conan the Barbarian when really they were in production at the same time. So, But we went over Temple of Doom with our commentary on that one. It's so much there, they just went far darker. That's than right. He's like, you know what? I got to try this. I can do better than that guy. You wait and see. So what's the trick here? Just not not slowing down, not backing down, and then... But, I mean, in his case, he kind of leaps. It's sort of like in yeah. uh, Last Crusade. Only the penitent man will pass. Wrong. The penitent rolling man will pass. I mean, it's not just as simple as kneel before God and you're not decapitated. You had that buzzsaw come out of the ground, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on, you, even if you go in with no fear, what, are you going to tell me they're not going to shoot the lasers at you, or do you still have to jump? As we'll soon discover, be confident and run for it. Seems to me that's how he comes out on top of his game on this one. But like the Swamps of Sadness, it's, I guess, testing his emotions. Is he up for the challenge? No laser eyes yet. All right, I'm within range. And then this guy, um, he, I guess he's cooked, and that's why he's all odd okay. looking. Just it a doesn't look human. too far in between the two statues. Theoretically, if you just run for it, you might make it through. Well, I wonder how good their tracking is, because they got to shoot the target together, evidently. It's not enough to get hit by one laser, right? I guess it's really a blaster, as it's not a sustained beam. Now, was this a human? Mm, what's left of him? Sort of a conquistador armor thing. Yeah, kind of human-like. Really cooked inside that armor right there. But you have to have something to build up tension. Can he make it through? Angawook's thinking, be confident. Bastion's thinking, be confident. We as the be audience are thinking, you. be confident. Yeah. There's there's Bastion telling him, be confident. Oh no, the eyes are opening. Run. What should I do? I guess I'll run. And he runs. Blaster fireman. You know, who's to say they're, they've only got one shot in them, right? Oh, hey, now he's on the ground. Shoot him. You might want to keep running just in case. Yeah, zigzag pattern. Stay low to the ground. And I think we're going to see Falcor getting an injection. There we go. Yeah, look at all that animation. The tail goes up. The legs stay still. You're in pain. Come on, getting shots isn't that painful once you get used to it. Right, but he he yells out, but that's really all he does. He yells mm -hmm. out and the tail rises slightly. Oh, but the next test, that's the worst one of them all. Not not hardly a test at all. Like, honestly, this magic mirror thing they could have just skipped. Like, there nothing comes of this. It's kind of just dead weight for in the screenplay, really. They could have just said he, one gate for the test, because this magic mirror thing is really quite pointless, isn't it? Yeah, for just one of many challenges he has along the way. They, if it, Suppose this magic mirror thing is in the book. Take some liberties here and change the challenge to something more involving. Okay, now if you've seen the music video to Lee Mall's A Never Ending Story... It begins right here, where Atreyu's kind of wandering in a delirium through the snow. The music begins, oh, and we it? see it kind of morphs into the image of what will be Limal singing, and what he's seeing here in this cave. Very good effect. But a lot of it is just a montage of scenes from the movie, blending in with 
the new yeah, footage I know I've of seen the, the music the video, video itself. not all that long ago, and I couldn't recall what all happened. But w- back then, when they did a song for a movie, it was a lot of clips from the movie in the video. That was the pretty standard way to go about it. And it looks like the snow's kind of not as fierce as he approaches this cave. He sees his reflection. There's these stalagmites on the ceiling. Yeah, we're not buying the real snow on him, are we? If that were real snow, it would have melted as soon as it hit him. It's uh, torn up tissue paper. But they do that in movies. This isn't the only example. Just fake artificial snow. And what's he see? Does he see Bastion? Or is that Bastion realizing himself and... And they kind of transition here. Looks like they see each other. No, I'm going to throw a book. This is going too far. It it wasn't far enough when we... Wait, what time is it? It looks like it's daylight out, isn't it? It's still kind of dark. Just from the attic, mostly. But there's sunlight coming from somewhere. It looks like there's sunlight, but we just had a storm after class, after school got dismissed, right? Right. I mean, there. okay, there's got to be something there for lighting on the set, sure, but... Was it daylight there all when of a sudden? When he threw the book, it looked, like there was, it looked like there was daylight coming out of the ceiling. When he, right when he threw the book. Uh-oh, we're just going to walk over here. Oh, yep. Such a tough test that was. Now we are breaking out the candles. I think they did a, uh, some of this out of order. They should have should have had the candles out by now. And there happen to be candles up in that attic? And a match to light them There's with? There's matches in there, too. Yeah, huh. of course. How convenient. Failing that, you'd think there'd be a light switch somewhere. And here we go. The real Southern Oracle. And it looks exactly the same. It's just this blue glowing effect. It may actually be the same... Uh, statues or maybe they poured a different mold because I think they have a different texture about them so I wouldn't say it's the same these have a kind of icy look about them and they crack but yeah I guess they could have made a mold uh, cast they made one cast it and couple times and there you go different materials kind of saving money not am- animating these uh, oracle faces you know just giving the voiceover yeah you have to give the childlike empress a name but it has to come from a human child. Well, how? Where am I going to find a human child? Not here. And we have done our part. We have told you all we can tell you. It is time for us to crumble. Now, when you watch this, you don't really know what Bastion says for the Empress's name. But you turn subtitles on, and it will tell you. And I'm wondering if Netflix's subtitles will will give the name. Because he kind of shouts it over the storm. Yeah, I'm not seeing the nothing attacking the Oracle. It's just kind of like they're crumbling anyway. Like, I don't see a cloud of... Of storm nothing approaching, you know? Mm hmm. Man, look at the clouds there. That is sweet. 
Got some hot cloud action. But there's a storm coming. Everything is luck with Falcor. With luck, with luck, 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 luck. What's for dinner with luck? How do we achieve our mission? We're gonna with kick luck. in the music. That's a uh, like a wire animation for for those shots. Uh, this has got to be incredibly dangerous. Like, you got to be clinching, holding on tight the duration of this ride. There is no sit back and chill. Wake me oh, when we definitely. get there. With how fast Falcor is flying, he's got. And there's no he's rope or something he's holding on tight to. 500 miles per hour plus? Like, I mean, he's booking it, isn't he? Yeah. And later on in the movie, when. The whole, ta the whole landscape is destroyed. It's there's nothing but the sky. It's like they're flying in space. Yeah, we'll so get to he's that. He's able to sustain space flight as well. Man, it must have been fun to grab those landscapes, right? Like to be on that helicopter crew. This is a composite shot here as he's looking over the stormy sky. Those are some powerful candles right there. The sea of possibilities. Uh, th this is kind of a hokey scene here where like a Treyu falls. They had a, a adult stunt double, like a small person or a short, it might have been a girl, uh, but but you can see a stunt double when um, Atreyu's grabbing onto the tree that lifts lifts Atreyu's feet up, and it's not uh, Noah Halfway. Man, they did not make good windows back in the 80s. You know, they're always blowing open from wind, right? The same thing mm -hmm. happened in... Uh, I think my last commentary, uh, Risky Business. Look at all those cobwebs. Attic's got an attic. Yeah. These spiders the size of your hand up there. washed up on the beach and this is an interesting area you, I get like this is a, another tearing up type moment right here when he comes across the rock biter and he gives his uh, soliloquy on on how he lost his friends and and you also see he discovers the story he's a part of so it becomes like a very meta film moment for for the character And also, it is kind of sad also when you see, like, Falcor yelling, Atreyu, and they can't find each other. He's got to be searching the wrong area, because surely you'd be able to see the Luck Dragon, right? Yeah. But how far high up in the, in the sky is he above those clouds? The Falcor is kind of semi-close to land. He's just along the Yeah, he might be searching the wrong, the wrong beach. island. Here's the rock biter. I remember my brother telling me about this movie, seen it in theaters before I did. He described this rock biter. It's this big guy on a motorcycle who eats rocks. I'm like, 
immediately I was imagining what that would look like. And you're probably not this necessarily. Nope. I like this. They look like big, strong, good, big, good, strong hands, don't they? He couldn't hold on to him. The nothing took him. Like, does the nothing play on emotions too? Was there some emotion that came over him that he wasn't strong enough to hold on to them for so long? Maybe people stopped believing in night hobs and stupid bats, but they still believed in rock biters for the time being, and therefore the nothing didn't claim him. And uh, Falcor picks up the Auron, right? Which, no easy feat giving the limitations of, of that puppet, right? Yeah. He, like, dives in the water somehow, spotted it. Finds catches it in it with the ocean. Teeth. Yeah. Which is hard enough when you're a human in the ocean looking for it, let alone flying above. It would have to, there'd have to be something you'd see from above the water where you see it's glowing where I mean, it, it fell in there. It has some light shine off of it. It doesn't glow bright and like cast a beam up in the sky as far as I can tell. It's no lightsaber. Uh, and uh, Atreus like, oh look, he's just going to repeat that line again. Like he's some NPC in Final Fantasy, and he just hit the dialogue box too many times. It's like, oh, he's going to repeat the same thing. I'm, I'm just going to start walking. And here we go. We are coming full circle. Where he comes along these frescoes here, it's we're retold the earlier events, things leading Somebody up to now. Somebody had had taken the effort to paint the story. Even the chapters yet to be played. Somebody's on to him. Atreyu was being watched or something. Had a okay? little bit of code red to go down the wrong way there. <clears throat> and here we are. We're caught up with the present, the f the image right there. So, is Gamork sitting there watching them paint him? Like, hey, I'm posing for the picture. Big time limitations on uh, this puppet. Nowadays it would be it CG. Like, oh, big time, yeah. But I couldn't, I can't really rip that choice. There'd be so much more movement. I mean, they could also do, do more now with animatronics that they could pull this off with uh, some animatronics. <clears throat> which I think would be kind of preferred. I don't think they would actually go to the effort. It would be easier for them to just CG it, right? <clears throat> too much, too easy. Hence the Lion King re remake with all the CG lions and everything. Yeah. I mean, they they look like real lions, but... They call it live action, but there's no live to it. Yeah. It's like just visual eye candy. Like, oh, remember the original? Well, we can do better than that. There's a lot of nose snout animation on this wolf, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, I don't think dogs typically can animate their 
their nose so much, right? Like the nose doesn't jiggle about when they're barking. All the blood around his mouth or something. Like, is that earlier victims? I had to eat something during this trek. It's so black that if you're watching this on TV, you couldn't see the fur. I, I kid you not. All you can really see is the eyes and the, the teeth. And the emptiness that's left when people stop believing. Why are you helping it? Because they're easier to control, right? <clears throat> People who have no hopes are easy to control. Sounds like some kind of amendum on modern politics. Big time glowing eye action right there. Good green glow effect with the eyes. Yeah, they weren't really glowing earlier. They looked bluish and then they, they've turned a glowing green. And I like the uh, the line here from Atreyu. Was it, have at you. Uh, come for me or something. Uh, I'll resist you. Something like that. Uh, I guess we're about to see. He didn't have any weapons, but he has found a sharp rock. And Atreyu disposes of Gamork so easily. Not a, not a real fight here. This, this could be seen as a letdown in the fight category. You just cut away to some uh, cloud, and then, oh, it's, it's over. No parting dying words from Gamork, nothing. Just, okay, easier than I thought, I'll keep walking. Okay, so there's a slight shimmer on the Orin, right? Like, this isn't, this isn't that bright to be seen from the sky. Only if you were close enough to the ocean would you see also it. Also entirely impossible for the puppet to grab that with the teeth. So they they kind of uh, faded shots of it going in. You know, someone put it in his mouth, uh, fade to that, and edit it together. Now this is not Noah Hathaway walking here. So much tree uprooting. Well, the nothing's going real full storm now. People quit believing in those rocks, you know? <clears throat> now, a lot of those rocks, they moved practically, and then some of them you see have a... seem to have the, the kind of... Uh, tinge around them from the composite and once again we get this last another falcor to the rescue oh, an and it's such a weird thing you have this like he, he's moving in fast right but then you have this kind of like slow moving hoof type like foot come from a, just barely in frame yeah and okay here's what i was talking about looks like they're flying in space yeah, definitely. I, I've always thought black this sky, is all these, space here. All these stars everywhere. You know, what powers does the Auron really grant you? I mean, we only really see it do one thing for him, and that is right here where he asks it to show him the ivory, ivory tower if it still stands. Which, theoretically, if he didn't ask and those rocks moved out of the way as they would have, would it not have been there? Hmm, we don't know. But theoretically, it's a talisman mm -hmm. to help him along his quest. That's explanation enough. 
they 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 said it guide let the Oron guide you, right? But they didn't tell him what to do. Uh, it doesn't actually look like sat nav. I don't see a screen to read out the directions. It probably doesn't have text to speech, right? No. Left turn on Sea of Sadness, you know, like. So and now does it's it work like a up. compass? Okay. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, but see, wouldn't these rocks have gone that way anyways? Like, or did the Oron move the rocks? Like, you have to wonder. Hmm. It is also so hard to get the actual track used here. Someone had uploaded on YouTube, but you never hear the version in the movie on a CD or anywhere available. It's always got like a a backing guitar and other thing, other sounds in it that kind of muddle it. <clears throat> Fashion eats up this apple awful fast. Yeah, he went for that sandwich first, didn't he? Now he's on the apple. You can't mess around with apples back then either. They go brown quick. Uh, yeah. I, I eat Honeycrisp apples now. They they stay they stay pretty uh, edible th for an extended period of time. Good and but there's something about movies where you have a, a character eating an apple. <clears throat> and right here, how much time passed since he grabbed the apple? They were flying towards the ivory tower. It looks like he's almost finished with the apple. Did, does he eat the core here even? He must have ate the core. Had to. He didn't slice it up. And yeah, Falcor does not come in for a landing. He's just already laying there. And here's the big reveal how coming tiny up. Is the, how tiny is the Empress's chambers? Because it looks like it's off... It, you, you, as soon as you go through that door, you're pretty much at the edge of that platform, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the big real, reveal coming up. She's just a young girl. Yeah, which, as you pointed out, rightfully, if they just called her the Empress, then, huh, you're a little girl. It, like, it could have been a surprise. Uh, this actress, though, her name's Tammy Stoik, I think. She's a ballerina, and she doesn't look that much different today. I mean, you can see, oh, hey, yeah, she was the childlike Empress. You can kind of see it. Of course, uh, you know, she's, like, in her 40s, and I think she's a mom and all that, right? Yeah, she's like, what, 11, 12 here? I think that he walked into this chamber and they had a... This is a different set altogether. This is a much bigger looking room than what was available at the top of that tower. I failed you, right? We get some good lines out of her in very short period of time. Also quite cryptic-like in that kind of Yoda way. Like, the characters with all the knowledge can't be that forthcoming. Like no, you haven't failed. She does a really good job here. Can you can you imagine like a lot of girls her age not being able to pull off this role? With, no, because you have to have like this stoic, stoic, uh, knowledgeable presence type thing. But you're a young kid, and above that, cast a girl who's attractive enough, who has the right look for a an empress. My horse died. I nearly drowned. And, and well, you already knew. It's just unfortunately, child actors kind of get a bad rep, but you cast someone who can really act. You see, when they, I they was, did really good at this one. When I heard of the stigma of child actors not being able to act, it it hadn't dawned on me that child actors couldn't act because I watched this movie all the time. And I thought, all the kids in this movie act well. So, like, where, where's all these bad acting kids? And then you see other things, like Mac and Me. Or, uh, or, or, or a litany of other stuff. And then you realize, okay, now this is where the stereotype comes. And, of course, Jake Lloyd in Star Wars Episode One, All the flack he got. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say entirely his doing... It, it, kind of a bad call to make Anakin Skywalker a little kid when we meet him. Mm-hmm. They put a hyphen in there on the subtitles, and in the American title, it's never-ending. You capitalize E in the middle of the word. 
you know, she's talking about Bastion, and it's the message of this movie. It kind of it kind of defeats itself in a way because it's like a, it's a movie about reading and that reading is good, but you had to watch a movie to tell you that. Or the movie's about believing. But there's a lot going on here, too. Like, uh, in some ways, he's coping with the death of his mom, and he seems to have dealt with it by the end. Though he doesn't then... Uh, go. There's no, like, ending coda thing where he comes up to his dad and tells his dad off. As he questions it, the nothing grows stronger. I have to keep my feet on the ground. She's remaining awful calm amid all this. Yeah. Nice effects there, by the way, these rocks. They hear them. Oh, that pesky window. Now a branch is flying in? Like, there needs to be some more concern here about finding Bastion. I mean, we've got a tornado in the city. Now we've, we've gone to this POV shot where she's looking at Bastion, basically. If he wasn't immersed in this story before, he certainly is now. You can definitely see the foam there under the layers of the ivory tower model. Here we go. See if it says the name on Netflix. Moon Child. That, with a space. Moon I think that the, Child. The German, it's it's a little bit different, but it is kind of a name in Germany. And, and Bastion says but, something yeah. earlier, like, my mother had the most beautiful name. So yeah, he thought of it, his mother's name, okay, Moonchild, I'm assuming that was her nickname. Uh, in, in Germany, there is a name that comes up on occasion. It's a rarer name, you know, but uh, but that could be a name in Germany. You can see she has long hair in, in one of these shots, like when they're side by side. You don't see the ponytail otherwise. I kind of think she has just really short hair. That's all that's left of my kingdom. Just a tiny Fashion, I need glow. you to, to write a stimulus check for Fantasia. Me? I like all the stuff she says. In the beginning, it, it's always dark, you know, like, call my name. Gives them the grain of sand. Um, did they have tiny enough LED lights with a battery source back then? Are they maybe running a wire through the fingers? Something like that. You know, the laser sight on Arnold Schwarzenegger's gun in The Terminator... They didn't have laser sights back then on guns, in a way. You can you can see a huge one on Tango and Cash that Kurt Russell has, but they, they had to run wires through Arnold's jacket for that sight to work uh, back then. So I'm curious at how they would have actually done that grain of sand. Uh, obviously, you could you could. Uh, you know, in the in the back there, there could be a a, a filament wire or something stick, sticking out, it mounted to the wall in the back, or who knows. Just the way this is shot. So not only is Bastion capable of wishing Fantasia back and restoring everything, right? Does he restore Gamork? 
in it, as sort of a fairness, like I I'm gonna I would decide to restore everybody so Gamork gets a shot too at redemption. Would that be a thing to include if you were making a director's cut? Good question. You get a better but, shot of his bike there. But it's like it doesn't really look like much of a bike. It's like a a stick attached to a steamroller. So much more to all of this is just what you believe, what you want to envision. All right, no purple buff either. But there's there. Look, Artax is alive, but that but that death scene really hits. And I feel like anytime heroes die in superhero movies, you it's always like, oh, they're not really dead. Okay, whatever. They'll come back a sequel. You know, something like that always seems to be the case. It's always easy to brush aside. And for an '80s movie, when the your power demographic audience to bring... is is young kids, what? of course they're gonna abuse the power, bring them into the real world. Yeah, but for an audience watching this, just so much of it hits right home. Oh, especially this right this, here, where the this bullies scene get their would look much different in in today. You'd see them. You see different shots of him going through the city. Uh, much, much more interaction between the environment. They're not so tough now, are they? Uh, let's go to our trusty trash can. can't be uh, an American city. There, somebody would have shot at him, right? I got tripped up in the uh, homeless encampment. I don't know. It's just some debris sitting on the side. He got off easy. Otherwise, in the trash can, he goes. Kid on the right there looks a lot like Tim in Jurassic Park right here with the dust on him. Yeah, kind of. And here we are. There's the narrator's voice. Uh, but that's a story for another time, right? All right? But that's another story. Is that Coriander narrating? finally return to the ordinary world. Don't cry. And we'll yesterday. safely assume There's Bastion the returns world. the book. You know. I, yeah, you're right, Gerald McRaney. Man, I had not realized that. We're, when we're hitting that, uh, that song again, any closing comments you got there for the never-ending story? just a, a movie I never get tired of watching and some with repeat viewings there's always something there in the movie something about the movie yeah, that's I mean, so there's, eye filling you notice I've seen more and more the lot, more you watch and it I just, I just now noticed the side profile shot of really the rock biters trike uh, thing you know uh, just little things uh, it sounded like I was picking the movie apart a lot I've I've seen and enjoyed this movie so many times. It's I had to look at it with a, a different eye here, try to figure out what, how it would be made different if done today, if if rebooted, how have you, and how it would have changed. Because I think a lot of people look at stuff and they say, oh, these the CGI is so fake. It was so much better when things were practical. Well, yes and no. There's limitations in both directions, and you see a lot of the limitations here in in how things have to be shot and edited and it doesn't necessarily tell the most cohesive story when you have just a a tiny little foot hanging off uh, off the side of the frame for to rescue a tray you twice you know yeah and so much of it just plays off the heartstrings especially a lyric in this song in your hands the birth of the new day it's like yeah, i i should really know the lyrics to this uh, it's got good it, it's got really Rhymes will keep their secrets, but never fall behind the clouds. Something. Uh, it's like with dark days, yeah. there's always brighter tomorrows. Yeah, this. You know, it's amazing. You get. You feel pretty good after this. Watching this, you know. So that's going to do it for our commentary on the Neverending Story. I'm not sure what I've got in the pipeline next. Uh, I may have to watch the second one. I'm. I'm going to have to do a commentary at some point here on maybe Conan the Barbarian. Um, so till next time, see you guys later. All right. Bye-bye.